customers. As the CEO of a B2B platform, you know this better than anyone. But the new normal has also brought you a new solution, a solution that will help you create value and solve the challenges your customers are currently facing. Introducing Proxera, an open global network that connects your platform to other platforms and trade services, bringing your customers a new world of possibilities. This is what Proxera can do for you. Let's take a closer look at Neha, one of your customers. Neha, like many others, owns a local business, a sundry store that sells daily necessities. With COVID-19, it's been difficult for her to get milk powder and other new products from her existing suppliers. Neha feels like she has no other options. Now let's reimagine Neha's story with Proxera, the power of a global reach. By connecting your platform to Proxera, you can give Neha options. Now, as Neha searches for milk powder, she is presented with a world of opportunities. Opportunities you have brought to her through the Proxera network. All filtered to what she wants, all relevant to what she needs. Neha's options have just been expanded with new suppliers on other platforms, both locally and globally. She is now able to find the right product for her customers, and more importantly, at the right price through you. By connecting your platform, Proxera enables Neha to connect with other platforms beyond yours. It also doesn't stop there. Proxera also helps overcome financing, logistics, and payment challenges faced by your customers. So connect to Proxera today, and you will find that there is nowhere in the world that's out of reach. Proxera, bringing the world to you. I think we, we are just getting started with the fintech revolution. And I think one particular space, which is the SME segment, and I'm including micro SMEs in that segment, is really crying out for much greater innovation. So you'd see a lot of disruption in the ability to service the micro SME and SME space, which has a much broader agenda for inclusive growth. It calls for more collaboration, as the need for fintechs and banks to work together has never been greater. You know, the first thing financial institutions can do is continue to invest to be more digital. Uh, I think that should not slow down. And your ability to do partnerships with fintech players, I think you need more partnerships, you need more collaboration. And if you can do that well with the sole objective of keeping your consumer and the businesses that you serve at the heart of that engagement, I think you're going to have a really exciting journey for financial institutions. Welcome back. You are with the Singapore FinTech Festival 2020. It's all about the road for recovery. This is part of our economic summit. It's great to have you with us. I'm Manisha Tank. So I'm now going to be joined by Dr. Raghuram Rajan, who is a professor at the University of Chicago Booth School, as we talk about a world in recovery. Uh, lots of subjects to cover, and uh, it's all coming up right now. So hopefully we can check in uh, with Dr. Rajan. He is live from Chicago. Are you there? Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Um, I probably need uh, um, um, the tech people to just increase your volume. I can't hear you. 
Okay, well, we, so we shall try and get on with that. Uh, this um, is better. This you've is got better. us. Go Excellent. Ahead. So this has been a feature, hasn't it, <laughs> of the last yeah. year, uh, getting used to the pandemic. What's it been like for you as a, as a professor, uh, managing your students, managing lectures? H how has this worked for you? Well, it's, it's obviously much more difficult. You see the value of meeting people in, uh, in person. Uh, teaching a class on Zoom is, is much more difficult. Um, of course, the students can go to sleep while you're talking, and you don't get that feedback, uh, because what you see is they've, put, they've shut off the video camera. And when you tell them to put it on, well, some of them complain the link is weak, so they need to put it off in order to hear you. So <laughs> you really can't complain. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's tough. It's even tougher on the students, of course, than on the faculty, and that's that's really part of what's going on. We're trying to manage, and hopefully, we will see it through over the next few months. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people around the world saying that. So, look, before we progress with our conversation, I want to want to make sure that the world gets to know you even better than you are already known. So, you're a grad of an IIT, a grad of an IIM, and also MIT. Uh, and there's much more to boot. There are books. There are economic papers, and most importantly, in my book, you love South Indian food, which is a fantastic, um, <laughs> fantastic choice. Uh, but all of this, I'm just pointing to the fact that you have such a, a varied background. You've been all over the world. You've been, you are the former governor of the Indian Central Bank. You've seen it all. Uh, in an economic sense, uh, how are you feeling this year has gone? Well, badly, of course. Um... Um, one might argue that the vaccines, uh, given what the epidemiologists were talking about, the advent of the vaccines is, is really good news because that puts an end, uh, you know, sometime next year uh, to, this, uh, to this horrible pandemic. But, uh, you know, economies have been significantly damaged by this, and some of that damage is hidden by the tremendous amount of, uh, of government help that has been on offer in the industrial countries. In the emerging markets, there's been less help, but even there, uh, you know, because of the buoyancy of stock markets as a result of, uh, you know, the support in the reserve uh, currency central banks, some of that bad news is being masked, and it really comes to light over time, as we see some businesses not starting up again, as we see kids having been out of school for a long time, not being able to pick up uh, where they left off, uh, as we see, you know, uh, office, more, uh, office uh, uh, buildings and shopping malls closed down. So I think it's still early days to assess the extent of dam damage, and we should be prepared to deal with it when, we, when it shows up. Yeah, I'm really glad that you said that, because I was looking up some of the numbers in terms of global GDP. So the OECD is saying that it expects a global GDP to contract 4.2% uh, this year, uh, and that is actually an upward revision from 4.5%, uh, which was predicted back in September. That was the September estimate. But when I look at these sorts of figures, I begin to wonder what relevance they really have and whether they're really telling us enough at all. We have to look much deeper, don't we? We do, because what you want to think about is what is the sustainable pace of growth once everything sort of goes back to a semblance of normalcy. And uh, what happens with something deep and, uh, and uh, you know, um, lasting over a year like this is certainly some sectors are much more deeply affected than others. Clearly, restaurants uh, that haven't got any business um, you know, airlines that have only modest international business. I mean, those are entities that are going to be hurting, that will have to resize, that will have to restructure their capital structures. And so, uh, yes, we can go back, uh, you know, to a significant fraction of GDP simply by the pent-up demand. People have, uh, especially richer people who have continued working, have got savings that they will spend and you're seeing some of that pent-up demand when you look at countries, you know, third quarter or fourth quarter GDP. But first, we have a second wave many countries are dealing with, which will again curb activity. But also longer run, uh, these firms that go out of business, these kids that have, uh, have not learned as well, that will be the longer term damage that will show up. And we need to be prepared for that and address those, uh, that damage directly. Yeah. As we uh, continue to take stock of how it's gone over the year, though, and I appreciate that you say it's too early to say, but we can assess uh, both fiscal 
and monetary response around the world. I want to start with the USA. That's where you are. Um, and when you look at the numbers on coronavirus cases, they're really, really alarming. Uh, there is no other word for it. Uh, and of course, the number of fatalities in the US at more than 280,000 now. Uh, with this backdrop, how do you feel the economic response has been to something where ordinarily we didn't, we didn't talk about healthcare first and foremost, but now we're talking about it as much as we're talking about the economy? Yes, I mean, clearly the first task was to contain the virus, and the U.S. has not done a great job there. Um, where it has done a better job is both in the monetary support uh, broadly, not just to the U.S., but to the world. It has uh, offered an enormous amount of support, and also to uh, the fiscal support that has been uh, quite generous, uh, certainly in the first wave uh, with the CARES Act. The problem, however, was all this, uh, certainly the fiscal support was targeted at a virus which would be contained in the first two or three months. And the fact it hasn't been contained, the first wave hasn't been contained, and we're seeing a dramatic and even more virulent second wave uh, now uh, enveloping the U.S., uh, suggests that there is need for more support uh, to the uh, small and medium firms, to the households, especially given that now an end game is in sight, that much of the United States that wants to be vaccinated should be vaccinated by, by mid-year or uh, somewhat later. So um, the, the point here is that the U.S. now has to figure out how much support it offers uh, in order to carry the economy through. But certainly on the uh, monetary and fiscal front, it has been quite lavish. Uh, it's also been a little different from Europe in the sense that there is more incentive for firms to uh, essentially restructure and not maintain status quo, while a lot of the European aid has been to firms for sort of keeping the pre-pandemic status quo, which may be unviable once the support falls off. Yeah, actually, I want to come back to that a little bit later in the conversation because I want us to address the issue of debt. But before we get there, let's bounce over to India. And I was very keen uh, to understand from you what you thought of the response back home. Well, uh, again there, I think the issue has been that the pandemic hasn't been contained very well. Uh, India is, of course, a large, poor country, uh, uh, you know, and has done, you know, enormous uh, sort of amounts in terms of, say, the production of personal protection equipment, in the testing. I mean, India is testing a huge number uh, today for a, uh, a country of its per capita GDP. So uh, it's done a lot, but it was relatively unprepared. The lockdown that was imposed did little uh, to uh, sort of contain the virus. It may have stemmed the flow a little bit. Uh, it may have allowed India to prepare more. But longer term, I think India hasn't contained the virus as much as it should. And that ha has its consequences because, of course, people are scared of going out. People are scared of uh, going to restaurants. And that hurts uh, activity. A lot of Indians are employed in the service sector especially the high contact service sector. So activity has slowed considerably, both as a result of the lockdown, but longer term as a result of the damage that has been done. Unlike Western countries, unlike Japan, India simply hasn't had the resources uh, to put uh, to helping households and small and medium firms. Well, speaking of resources, it uh, is a natural segue to talk about China, isn't it? Uh, and of course, in China, very quick reaction, the lockdowns in Wuhan. And I remember reporting on them day by day and reporting case numbers day by day as well. Uh, but, but there you have an economy that seems to be bouncing back with a vengeance and a very, um, a very vibrant digital finance sector as well. Can you just tie those threads together and talk to us about the somewhat different pathway that China is on? Well. Uh, China, of course, um, did miracles in containing the virus for a country, again, of its size, 1.3, 1.4 billion people, uh, and to have, uh, by all counts, about 3,000 deaths is just uh, near miraculous. It was obviously a combination of support uh, of, of action by the government as well as support from the communities. Uh, which uh, took on the task of enforcing social uh, distancing requirements, quarantines, etc. So, uh, yes, all uh, 
you know, if those numbers are in fact real, and I have no reason to believe they're not, it's it's near miraculous what they've done uh, on containing the virus. And of course, as a result, uh, they they back. Uh, they uh, wherever there is a hint that the virus may be re-emerging, uh, they've got uh, very strong uh, tracking, testing, uh, tracing, uh, etc. Now, I would say that uh, their economy is back, uh, you know, uh, even on the services side. Uh, they certainly have strengths going into the pandemic. They had weaknesses also, including the massive amounts of debt. Uh, those strengths and weaknesses are still there. Uh, in a sense, the pandemic was very episodic for them, unlike for the rest of the world, which is somewhat ironic, given that it started there. Um, the um, you know, uh, Chinese uh, focus on digitalization, especially of finance, has been, uh, again, something to observe. Uh, the, uh, you know, QR codes being ubiquitous, the ability to make payments and financial, uh, for example, its, its rapid expansion. Uh, I mean, these are all, um, uh, China is, is a leader in, uh, in, in these low-cost payments, uh, as well as you know, uh, and for example, moving into holding money market funds, etc. What is interesting now is, of course, the recent reaction to the Ant IPO, and whether in fact there is a, a sympathy or a certain amount of tension between uh, the private sector here and the government. Very much so. So on that note, I wanted to pick up on some major news events apart from the pandemic that have unfolded in the last month or so. That is, of course, the US election. Now, how do you think or do you even think that there is going to be any shift in the fiscal response, at least, in the United States with Joe Biden in the White House by January 2021? Joe Biden has certainly signaled the need for more fiscal support. And uh, what he's done is to push uh, both the Republicans and the Democrats uh, to negotiate something quickly um, as a sort of down payment because uh, communities are, are hurting. They don't have the resources to roll out the uh, vaccine. Um, and, uh, you know, the businesses are reaching the end of what they had from the Paycheck Protection Program. So uh, I think that. The idea is this is going to be a bridge, and once the Biden administration comes in, they will figure out a, a bigger package. Uh, this has pushed the Democrats who are holding out for a package approximately three times the size of what is being negotiated now uh, to, to uh, sort of talk to the Republicans. Hopefully something will be negotiated soon and provide that necessary bridge. That said, because of the transfers that have been made through the CARES Act, the generous transfers, there's still a fair amount of, uh, of savings, excess savings with households right now. And so that can see uh, the U.S. economy for some time. Uh, and, uh, and some of that will be spent as we go into next year. So uh, uh, yes, there is a need uh, to send more fiscal support to the areas which need it. Uh, but there's also pent-up savings waiting to come onto the market when the economy starts opening up again more widely. Yeah, so, so what I'm actually leading up to here is trying to piece the parts of the jigsaw together because an area that we haven't talked about yet, and obviously there are so many economies to talk about, but I'm going to just divide it up into the developed and the developing, the emerging economies. The emerging economies in particular haven't got as many headlines when it comes to stimulus packages or how the response to the pandemic has gone, but there is obviously a big division between the two. What have you observed? Uh, for sure, and this is where I think uh, we don't see the damage as yet, and we assume there isn't any, which I think is a mistake. I mean, if the developed economies spend 20% of GDP uh, in fiscal support of various kinds and credit supports, uh, that must be for a purpose. Yes, some of it may be wasted, some of it may be excessive, uh, but compare that to developing economies which spend, you know, by IMF counts, about 5%. Uh, while, uh, you know, developing countries in Africa, some of the poorer countries in Asia uh, are spending one, two percentage points of GDP. Now, 
the virus has not discriminated between countries. It's been an equal opportunity affliction, and it has basically affected many of these countries as badly, if not worse, than some of the developed countries. Perhaps the death rate has been lower because many of these countries have younger populations, because they have more, more people living in open villages rather than in closed urban areas. But uh, really, the damage has been significant. So my sense is some of this will show up only down the line. We will see the difference. And at that point, I mean, um, it may be a little late to act on it. We certainly, if, if you're an emerging market, have to think quickly at this point about how to deal with the uh, growing signs of distress. Now, um, again, thus far, um, it's hard to see this given that it's masked by a lot of stuff. People continue paying, for example, their debts so long as they have money. When they run out, that's when they stop because they fear eviction, etc. So given moratoria have been in place, given bans on eviction have been placed, when those come to an end, people keep, continue paying until they can pay no more, that's when you start seeing the bad loans. So there is a possibility that a lot of uh, the damage may be lagged, and we'll see this over time. We should be prepared for more, hopefully not not uh, as bad as we thought it could be with a prolonged uh, uh, virus, but it'll be more than what it is right now. Okay, and actually, Dr. Rajan, I'm so glad that you brought that up because this is something I know that you've been outspoken about uh, recently. Uh, let's just talk about two themes that you have been quite outspoken on. One of them is obviously debt levels, and the other is the fact that we should see this more as relief measures in terms of stimulus measures that we've seen around the world rather than stimulus. We're giving it the wrong word, we're giving it the wrong name. So let's start with debt and, and just, you know, in terms of where we are on debt, the figures are quite alarming. So the IMF as a percentage of GDP uh, showing that the gross debt position for advanced economies is 125.46%. Compare that to emerging markets and middle income uh, countries, 62.2%. Low income developing countries, 48.82%. I'm sure you know all of these figures. Uh, and Latin America, for example, emerging and middle income countries there. 81.56%. These are alarming numbers, aren't they? They are. Uh, I mean, for each category, they're approaching historical highs. Uh, for developed countries, this is close to what the post-World War II high was. Uh, and similarly for emerging markets. So uh, um, remember, the developing countries look low, 46% or whatever the number you said was. But uh, many of them are now defaulting. Uh, we've seen six or seven defaults already. And uh, many of them have serious debt stress. Part of the problem is some of the debt is also not counted in that number because uh, it's, it comes in different forms than, uh, than sovereign debt. Uh, the reality is that debt has been picking up. And of course, interest rates have been really quite low, which means that you can sustain higher levels of debt uh, you know, uh, at these low level of, levels of interest rates. But, you know, debt, uh, unfortunately, uh, is easy to roll over only when the lender thinks you're good for it. And um, it has a habit uh, when the lender thinks that, uh, you know, you may be in trouble because you can't raise the resources over time. That's when it turns very unfriendly and you can't even roll over existing debt. So uh, debt is your friend until it stops being your friend, and it won't tell you when it stops being your friend. So you have to be careful even at these low interest rates. And of course, uh, developing countries are finding that the markets that were so friendly to them uh, in the pre-pandemic years have turned hostile right now. It's very hard to issue. Um, uh, developed countries still, you know, interest rates for developed country debts are really plumbing the bottom. Uh, and so it seems as if, you know, don't worry, be happy, go spend. And I would say that's a reasonable thing to do right now. But so long as the spending is on high return uh, activities, right? So if you're trying to protect uh, households from hunger, that's a you know morally high return, but even uh, economically high return because you're protecting that household from going under. Uh, but you know the idea that now is the time for all sorts of frivolous spending. Uh, which we've dreamt of over the last so many years, I think that would be a step too far. Uh, so uh, budgets, deficits don't do matter, 
uh, we do need to get back to fiscal responsibility. The debt that is issued now will have to be paid at some point. So it, it is a good time to say, yes, let me focus on the spending that is absolutely necessary because there's so much of it that needs to be done. Uh, and for now, remember, we aren't worried about recapitalizing the banking system because by and large, uh, in the developed world, the banking system has stayed fairly uh, strong. Um, we aren't worried about recapitalizing the shadow financial system. But look at the level of market prices and worry about what happens if you start seeing volatility there, because then you start seeing the downsides of uh, you know, the kind of support that central banks have provided, because it creates a more fragile sort of uh, structure. Uh, let us pray that the financial sector doesn't get infected uh, by the combination of both the damage that is coming, but also the very, very uh, significant optimism that is embedded in financial markets right now. The sense that interest rates will stay low, low forever, that large companies will continue producing really healthy earnings, that, you know, in a sense, the pandemic doesn't even show up in the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the forecast. So that, that I, I think those are reasons to be concerned and to keep spare ammunition for what may happen next. But I have to say, Dr. Rajan, it doesn't feel like there's much spare ammunition anywhere. No, it, it is true that we are stretching, but I would say that uh, uh, that's all the more reason that uh, you be very careful uh, in how you spend and recognize there are limits. So this is about the right time to go. Remember, as soon as the pandemic hit, the support was unconditional uh, because very hard to you know, be very specific. I support this sector. I don't support that sector. You open uh, your, uh, you you open the cash till and pay anybody who needs it. Uh, that was the nature of the CARES Act, for example. Now you've got to be more careful. Who do I support? Uh, and you know there are businesses that are going to be unviable, even if the economy opens up in three four months. There are businesses that are going to be unviable because even when the economy opens up, consumer preferences are still. Uh, at a level where I don't want to be sitting next to somebody on a plane, uh, at least for the next, uh, next uh, year or so. Uh, so I'm not going to travel that much. I mean, so we are going to see a slow uh, recovery, even when the vaccine is, is, is widely available. And that's why it makes sense now to start thinking about how to make choices. I support this one. I don't support that one. And that's something governments cannot do. You need to involve markets. You need to involve market signals. Uh, you need to involve the private sector a little more carefully in making some of these choices so that public funds are spent very carefully and not in blanket support keeping the economy as it is because the economy needs to change. It's interesting you raise that because we just had a conversation with Commissioner Mareed McGuinness over at the European Union. And one of the things that came up quite strongly was this issue of financial digital literacy uh, and how you get the message across to SMEs and make sure that they don't end up in a really difficult position. If you do reach out to the private sector, how, how does one do that? Well, uh, I, I think the... Um I mean, take SMEs, how can we help them, right? And, and, and clearly, with digitalization, we have more opportunities uh, for large digital platforms to help SMEs uh, where necessary. And uh, one of the things to consider, uh, again, carefully, because large digital platforms already have substantial economic power, but it, can the public sector work through these digital platforms in offering support to some of the smaller producers who are in difficulty? Are there you know, uh, co-sponsored uh, loans, for example, uh, with the public sector not taking 100% of the loan losses, uh, but partial uh, loan guarantees where necessary? Uh, can we frame things a little more? Uh, can we structure things a little better, given that there is so much data available to these, these platforms uh, that's one example of how you can use the new digitalization to offer support in more targeted uh, ways. But you have to be careful that you're not over-empowering 
the private sector while you're doing this, uh, it has to be available through multiple platforms so that there's competition between the private, uh, various forms of the private sector. That's one example. There are so many others one uh, could, uh, could think about. The, the fact is that we also, uh, you know, this is a cliche, the pandemic has accelerated every previous trend. Uh, the trend towards digitalization is certainly something the pandemic has accelerated, but let us now make good use of it, right? The, one of the advantages pre-pandemic was small enterprises had access to a global market via the internet platforms. They could advertise wares, they could, they could do the logistics and actually uh, offers trust on both sides, uh, uh, both the buyer and the seller. And, and therefore enable transactions. Well, now let's make use of that. And uh, if necessary, uh, make use of that to help some of these small entities stay alive where, where, where they are in difficulty. Yeah, and, and with that in mind, there's been a lot of talk, hasn't there, over the last few months about what shape the recovery will take. And the new letter that comes up all the time, it's not so new anymore, of course, it's the K-shaped recovery. But I think this becomes very obvious, not just when we're talking about whole economies and, and a population, but it's also when we're talking about the nature of the companies that are doing better than others. You alluded to this earlier, there are some SMEs that will go out of business and they'll never come back. But then there are the ones that are in the FinTech sector or they're in digital payments. We're seeing a completely different trajectory for them. What is your new your agenda? What do you say are the prospects in terms of what the recovery looks like for different sectors? Certainly, it's going to be um, uh, different for different sectors. We, we know that already, right? Tech, as you said, is doing very well. Um, healthcare will do well as we put more resources into strengthening healthcare systems across the world. Um, there are a lot of new opportunities. The fact that we can do this conference on Zoom uh, the fact that a lot of services, high, uh, high uh, least skilled services can be provided at a distance. What that may mean then is that, uh, you know, we see more competition uh, across the world for those services. Um, telemedicine picked up during the pandemic. Uh, telemedicine can be done from Chicago to a suburb of Chicago. It can also be done from the Philippines to a suburb of Chicago. So. If the Philippines doctor has uh, the credentials that are required in the U.S., then perhaps that kind of, uh, of cross-border services can also be provided. Certainly, uh, the pandemic has opened up uh, the possibility uh, that much of this uh, uh, can happen. Uh, but it is also, I, I think, there are going to be sectors that are going to be very badly affected. Uh, we've talked about high contact services that will take time. The answer there is not so much to preserve the economy as it was before in those sectors, but to allow the natural churn to take place. Yes, it is going to be unfortunate for some businesses. They will have to close down. But so long as new businesses open up in those areas, new restaurants open up because, yes, there are a lot of uh, ex-waiters, cooks around, and uh, customers start going to restaurants again. But this time, you don't have those, uh, you know, um, restaurants which consume huge amount of resources and uh, and serve a small number of customers, maybe you make it more responsive to takeout because people, at least in the short run, are more likely to want takeout rather than uh, dine in. Uh, regardless, the point is that uh, post pandemic, we have to make financial resources available, credit available, so that startups can actually fill the holes that have been left in the places where firms have closed down. And that will enable many former entrepreneurs who lost their businesses to get a fresh lease of life. So I would argue that as much as helping those who can survive stay in place, and that's a, you know, it's difficult discriminating between the viable and the unviable, but we should also make it easy for new entities to start up, and that is going to restore health to the economy much faster. I sadly don't have too much more time left with you, but I do want us to talk about uh, something that you've been quite vocal on, and this is the difference between what is a relief measure and a stimulus measure. measure. What is your warning uh, when it comes to this conversation? Well, uh, I think uh, a lot of countries, certainly India uh, has been uh, part of this, uh, has uh, sort of mixed the two. Um, the relief measure is keeping the economy's uh, sort of productive capacity from shrinking. 
Uh, it's a way of, um, in a sense, keeping the body economy uh, economic alive while it is subject to lockdowns, while it is subject to significant business loss. And the idea is when things go back to normal and the demand comes in, the supply side is able to ramp up at that point. So, so relief measures are about largely protecting the supply side. They could have some positive demand side effects, but it's largely about protecting the supply side. Now, stimulus is different. It's about how do I generate more demand given the economy is relatively weak. And, uh, you know, uh, those stimulus measures, uh, you may contemplate them down the line when the pandemic ends. But if the economy has shrunk because too many small businesses have gone out of business, too many supply chains are broken, the supply side can't respond to that stimulus if, uh, if it's shrunken. And that's why you need to focus on both relief to protect what you can while the economy is, uh, is under the, uh, attack by the, uh, from the pandemic, and stimulus, if necessary, down the line. The hope is maybe you don't need stimulus. Things will, you know, there's pent up demand. It will lift the economy back. The government doesn't need to do much. Typically, however, in countries, you know, some government action is needed to jumpstart. If so, some stimulus will be needed. But you better have protected much of the economy. Otherwise, what that stimulus will do is just result in higher inflation. Yeah, uh, well, that's quite a warning, isn't it? Um, just finally, uh, I, I want us to project. I want us to project five, ten years from now. This is the decade of delivery. It's the transition to a more sustainable global economy, a more sustainable world. Uh, what is? You've been called a financial prophet. You've been called a rock star in the world of economics. What are the major issues that you're thinking about, and where will we be ten years from now? Well, I do hope we tackle the deep structural problems that affect the, the world. Uh, one is inequality within countries, especially developed countries, but also a number of uh, emerging markets, including, uh, I would argue, Singapore, uh, which is that the skilled, the, um, uh, you know, the capable are getting richer, uh, while the people who don't have the skills are getting left behind. And this is creating inequality of income. It's creating inequality of place, the left behind places versus the others. And if we don't uh, actually start tackling this in a big way, the political consequences of these tend to be very, very disruptive. And what we've done over time is instead of tackling this problem directly, because it seems uh, very hard to actually deal with, we've instead infused the world with tremendous amounts of fiscal and monetary stimulus, both post-global financial crisis and now. And the danger of that is it's, it's a palliative, actually a dangerous palliative, because it, uh, you know, it starts other forces, such as the forces of leveraging. And uh, you know, instead of having now just two once-in-a-century crises, we may have a once-in-a-century crisis every 10 years, unless we fix these structural problems. So my, my sense is uh, that, and this is especially important for developed countries, they need to understand that what they're facing is not a problem of stimulus. It's a problem of development. There are vast parts of the country which are falling behind and that need to, uh, to be more developed, to participate in the growth that these countries are capable of. And that requires a different kind of instrument, a different kind of focus. If we don't have that, I am afraid that uh, you know, all the lessons we've learned from the pandemic will go waste. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, climate change is going to be a big uh, issue uh, going forward. Yep. Uh, certainly, some of the other issues will be important. But I think inequality is also something that we need to focus on and to yes. deal with. Definitely, of course. Sadly, we're out of time. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Uh, Professor Raghuram Rajan, who is at the Catherine Dusak Miller Distinguished Service, uh, Professor of Finance over there at uh, the Business School in Chicago. I know that it's near breakfast time, so I hope you get to grab a very good South Indian breakfast, which I'm sure is your favorite. But from all of us here in Singapore and around the world, a huge thank you to you for your insights. Thank you. And we continue our coverage here on the Singapore FinTech Festival 2020.
normal brings about new problems, both for you and your customers. As the CEO of a B2B 